Hello, my name's Sheila Peace and I'm a professor of social gerontology at the Open University and I work in health and social care. But originally I studied human geography and later environmental psychology and I'm known I think as an environmental gerontologist but uh, I thought this morning that we'd consider what that means. And my concern has always been between the, the relationship between the person and their environment and how this may change or continue to evolve as people get older. In fact, in more recent years, I've focused on how a life course perspective can add greater depth to understanding of the personal experience of environmental complexity or the context in which we live. So that's going to be my focus in this talk. And I thought though that it would be useful to say something about the theoretical background to this area, which can be charted through urban sociology, ecology, psychology, and has been very individualised and context specific. Partly that's been driven by the research that's been done in this area, which originally uh, was dominated by funding in care settings, predominantly in North America during the 60s and 70s and 80s giving rise to research focused on quality of life and the consideration of how people age biologically and experience aspects of what came to be called, and still is to a certain extent, environmental press. So the difficulties that people experience in the environments they live in. The work of people like Paul Lawton as a psychologist interested in this area has dominated for quite a long period of time and other American colleagues who have looked at this relationship between person and environment, the fit between these two or the congruence between these two. So, I want to make that a broader environmental complexity uh, because I see this relationship between the person and their environment encompassing a lot of different issues. So there's the physical, the natural environment, or the material environment, the actual built and designed structures. But then there's the social, how places are used and organised, the roles and relationships between people, the gendered use of space and place, and cultural issues. So that adds to our understanding. Psychologically, obviously, we're in, involved in things like people's attachment to their places, the meaning that, that places have for people, and how they make them feel. And obviously, I mentioned the biological earlier on, but that whole issue of embodiment of places and spaces uh, I think it's something that's come around in this discipline, this multidisciplinary field, but certainly in sociology at the moment, the sociology of the body is, has got us to look at this area again. So, my brief talk, I'm going to focus on the last piece of research that I've been involved in, which is called Transitions in Kitchen Living. Now this is a study, um, well it is what it says, <laughs> um, it's a study of the domestic kitchen but it's a, a coming together of a collaborative te team of researchers, uh, gerontologists from the Open University but also ergonomists and designers from Loughborough University's design school. So. It's been an interesting study then, uh, uh, academically, in terms of how we're going to do this piece of research. But its aim was always to involve 
uh, older people or pe and people in particular ranging in ages from their 60s to their 90s in talking and uh, allowing us to examine their kitchens. And their kitchens had to cover a widest range of housing types. So we've worked with people living detached, semi-detached, bungalows, terraced housing, low-rise, high-rise apartments. And we've also worked with people who live in supportive housing, where the kitchen still functions as their domestic space, and mainstream housing. Uh, we haven't worked in the care home sector, where still in the main, the kitchen is more of an institutional communal facility. So, this was the project, Transitions in Kitchen Living. And we had to devise a way of doing this study that took on board the histories of the individuals who agreed to take part but also their contemporary kitchens. So we developed a system of housing history. So we charted with them all the places that they'd lived across their lives. And then we got them to talk through um, a very open interview, a more of an oral history interview, about the kitchens in those places. Now I mentioned people's ages a little while ago. Our oldest person was 91 when we interviewed them and had been born in 1919. Whereas the youngest person was born in 1948. And so you can see that that's quite a range in, in time for, pe for people's childhood experiences of the kitchen. Uh, and it relates also to the domestic equipment that will have come on board during that time. So those, and they were oral history interviews uh, that were done through very open-ended conversations with people about different stages of their life, life course. Now, but it did, we did arrive at some major themes and they were things that were you may see, think of as not being unexpected, uh, discussions around space, discussions around domestic equipment, uh, different tasks that were undertaken in kitchens by different members of the family. Uh, storage, a real issue in terms of design. Uh, but at the other extreme, we had very interesting discussions within this data around social etiquette, where people ate, when people moved from the kitchen to eating in the dining room. And it's a re very rich data set in itself. People's understanding of meaning of what they felt the kitchen represented in their domestic housing and the way that has changed over their life course also come out of this data. And we did it deliberately because we wanted to set a historical social understanding of this domestic space and then look at where uh, in current housing uh, the, the kitchen had evolved to now in terms of for these people. So in terms of their contemporary kitchens, we took a far more ergonomic uh, angle to the methodology. Um, we measured everything, every height of cupboards, every work surface, the distance between three items of domestic equipment, the sink, the refrigerator and the cooker. Now ergonomists tell me, and I'm not an ergonomist, um, that they call this the kitchen triangle and they look at the distance between these uh, items and the ways in which people can move around a kitchen space. I think one of the things that our study showed them, and they have said to me since, is the, the variety of triangles that, that they can develop within the kitchen. Going back to our study of the contemporary kitchens, we were interested to chart the equipment to, that people had to also measure their lighting readings for uh, 
lighting with and without electric lights uh, on in the kitchen. The lighting in people's domestic kitchens is very, very poor. We did a, a more structured interview with people in their kitchens, both to record their own use of the kitchen at different times of the day, um, as well as issues to do with their own health and well-being and how they were finding things more or less difficult to use. Um, and that was a quite a detailed interview. I think some of what I'm going to say is not going to be surprising uh, in terms of the physical layout of the kitchen and the fact that people had problems with uh, bending and stretching and reaching those top high shelves or getting down into a cupboard uh, that involved quite a lot of bending. Uh, but people coped in lots of different ways. They reordered things in their kitchens and we have really interesting examples of way people sort of sort out and, and gather together the things they use routinely and then they put them at the height in which they can use them. So things had been moved down and moved up. Um, people had bought some new equipment so they might have bought a carousel that was fitted into a corner cupboard cupboard to enable them very easily to get into the back of that cupboard but it was also true that there were other people who said i haven't been in that cupboard for 10 15 years i really don't know what's in there if you'd like to get down there and have a look that would be really interesting that did occur on one or two occasions um Dexterity, reading of uh, numbers, dials, those were all issues. Um, things like a washing machine that's got so many dials on it that could do anything and everything uh, for your laundry really weren't being used and people did say to us if it just had three buttons that would be much easier on off and a particular wash that's probably and and I can see that actually that's something that we all do at all ages and there are issues around certain pieces of domestic equipment there were other things that were difficult like windows that you can't open uh, because it's the other side of the sink the other only way you can get there is by climbing on a stool or in the main, I'd say at least 80% of our participants had steps, which some of which were very, um, I'm going to use the word risk, but they were dangerous in, to a certain extent, that they weren't very secure or very steady and they didn't have a, a, a something to hold on to. Um, so there were, there were certain issues that that people get round and people cope in their kitchens. But there are particular design issues around the height of work surfaces, the height of, of cupboards, the way in which when we talk to people historically, they all talk to us about the larder, that wonderful walk-in cupboard that many, many people used to have uh, many years ago which was usually a cupboard on an outside wall and often had a marble shelf that kept things cool uh, prior to refri refrigeration. Now, um, I think nearly uh, everybody would have loved a larder walk-in cupboard. Some of that's to do with space and certainly houses over time. Uh, the kitchens have got smaller, even though when we talk with the retail sector, um, you may see open plan kitchens with an island uh, for doing work on. Um, that there's a difference there between the housing type and, and what you can and can't do. So what I've wanted to do this morning then is to use this kitchen study to reflect on where I started, which was an issue of looking at the person in their environment. And I think it's fair to say that our study of the kitchen, whilst it does focus in particular on the way in which as people get older and their 
embody the kitchen in a way so they find that they can't bend so far or they can't see so well or they can't uh, hear something that's uh, going off, uh, you know, ringing or uh, 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 making a noise in, a, in maybe an adjacent room or the current room. Um, these are all issues that have an influence on perhaps what is, has always been seen as the hub of the home. Um, the hub of the home, it's an interesting one too because it's always seen as a very gendered space and something as a kind of woman's place within the home. And yet, in our sample, we deliberately had two-thirds women and a third men. We, as people got older, they were more likely to be living alone. They were likely to be using the kitchen uh, at particular times. And we certainly had... Um, people, men and women, who were keen cooks and wanted to be in that space and really used it to their advantage. And others for whom it was no longer a place that they spent all that much time. And there's a whole issue too about the way in which um, buying frozen meals actually enables people to stay put in their own homes. 41 out of our 48 people had a microwave. And how people were using the microwave across the age range here was interesting. And they may be having more support coming in from home carers helping them with those kinds of meals. So real extremes here in, in what's happening in the kitchen. And it's been very useful for us to be able to look at the complexity of people's lives across time, how they've gone for our oldest of participants from perhaps being people who didn't have electricity, didn't have gas, uh, had to go down the road with a bucket to get water amongst our oldest of oldest participants to the current contemporary kitchen and what's on stream, what people can do to enable them to function a different way. Of course, taking a, a life course approach does make you think that this is a, quite a complex area. And so I suppose the environmental complexity is not just about the natural environment or the physical environment of buildings and spaces and places but it's also about the social environment, so people in those places, their roles, their organisations. It's about the psychological side, so it's interested in attachment, the way people are attached to places and the meanings they have for them, how they make them feel. And it's also something that can be culturally distinguished or has a specific gendered focus. So all of those issues affect how we consider the environment. And finally, I'm coming back to the way people embody places as they age is important too. So I think we can see the environmental complexity in this kind of work.